Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Dig Deeper. Good afternoon, Stephen. Good How are you afternoon. Doing? Nice to see you again. Lovely to see you. The sun is shining. Can you hear the lawn mowing? There's somebody mowing the lawn oh, outside. <laughs> what I want, what I want is I want to, I want to smell the lawn mowing. That really is the smell of you know spring and early it summer. Is. I was out there on Sunday afternoon doing my suburban man thing and i was mowing the lawn and it smelled great <laughs> oh you see this is when you want smell vision don't you You kind of want to kind of uh inhale the the smell of, of the grass next door and i used to hate it i used to i used to just be so angry and frustrated <laughs> and it would have fights with my dad about mowing the lawn and now yeah. i love it <laughs> the therapeutic. My dad. Yeah. I, I like it i mean it doesn't answer back it doesn't it's not complicated it's a you job just, you can just see the beginning to end you can see yeah, yourself you doing get something to complete good. it yeah i can see i um, wish the rest of my life was as uncomplicated as my lawn well maybe that's middle age for you You and i just kind of prattling on about lawn mowing you and don't have sunshine. a lawn you're in london what do you have no you have i don't a, i don't i'm envious you have of grass in mow. the cracks of the pavement that's what you that's your lawn <laughs> yeah exactly lawn mowing luxury <laughs> um that's uh that's for you country folk out there that, that have lawns to, to mow um but it's great to be back as we journey through ephesians together and we're going to take a look today at ephesians chapter 3 beginning at verse 1. shall i read song. this time yeah let's see you're reading from david bentley hart david bentley hart right? ephesians 3 1 to 13. fantastic let's go okay so i haven't read this yet i've been reading in preparation for this, I was reading my my normal, like just the NIV. So yeah, I'm yeah. going to be reading this uh, David Bentley Hart cold. Okay. See what he does. Okay. All right. For this reason, I, Paul, am the prisoner of the anointed one, Jesus, on behalf of you, the Gentiles. If indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace given to me for your sake, that the mystery was made known to me by a revelation, as I briefly wrote you before regarding which you can, by reading of it, understand my insight into the mystery of the anointed, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed in spirit to his apostles and the prophets, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellows in a single body, and fellow participants in the anointed one Jesus, through the good tidings, of which I became a minister by the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the operation of his power. This grace was given to me, the least of all the holy ones, to proclaim to the Gentiles the good tidings, the unfathomable riches of the anointed, and to cast light upon what constitutes the stewardship of the mystery that from the ages has been hidden in God, who has created all things, in order that through the assembly the manifold wisdom of God might be known to the archons and powers in the heavenly places according to the purpose of the ages, which he fashioned in the anointed one, Jesus, our Lord, in whom, through his faithfulness, we have boldness and access in confidence. Therefore, I ask you not to grow faint during my afflictions on your behalf, which is your glory. Oh, right. Great. He definitely has a different tone, doesn't he, DBH? Different yeah, it's, style it's, that he writes. Yeah. I was in my research on this, these three 13 chapters apparently these 13 verses are just two sentences or, <laughs> or very few sentences there's a bit of a debate how many sentences it really is but again right. it's one of these long drawn out multiple clauses and in dbh you can't see it because it's the audio only but uh the way dbh writes he puts lots of dashes in it's, it he it's clear he thinks that paul is like starting a sentence going on to a new thought coming back to a, his yeah, old thought okay so. Well, for those, there will be some people watching because we do put this out on YouTube. Oh, very um, good. So they will have seen, they will have seen that um, uh, all the same. Um, but yeah, it was a, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Apparently the Greeks were known for their long sentences. And of course we don't have, we, we, we have to add punctuation. And no punctuation. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have to guess where those sentences might be. I mean, sometimes exactly. there's obvious places, but, but two sentences, a lot of words and i don't know i mean i remember uh, as i was reading it on um sunday yeah that actually paul paul can feel quite hard to access a lot of the time you know it right. feels quite wordy quite like lots of clauses lots of yeah. different you know oh i'm gonna i'm gonna explain this a bit more i'm gonna add another adjective in here another theological word in there um you know i think i think it's quite a challenge i think often to read um to read Read I mean, it can maybe help if you think of him less like 
some pointy-headed academic who's trying to impress you with his long words, and maybe more like an excitable uh, <laughs> Jewish man who's just talking really fast and yeah. has lots of thoughts he wants to get out really quickly because he cares about it so much, right? Yeah, yeah. That's how I've heard Philip Yancey describe these guys. I don't, do you know Philip yeah, Yancey? Yeah, like, yeah, I love him. Yeah, no, and he was saying, he was talking about Jesus, actually, and he was like, you gotta, we got to think he's less like some austere white uh, Swedish guy. And he's a bit more like George <laughs> Costanza from Seinfeld or something. Like he's, <laughs> he talks quick and he's always moving and he's got lots yeah, of words. Okay. And, yeah, and like, yeah. Oh yeah. That makes sense actually. Yeah. 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 And actually, <laughs> I think that's... Paul might've been like that. Right. And it's, you know, we're dealing with a text that's 2000 years old for all the benefits of modern day translation. There is still the sense of, and that is the balance, isn't it? When you're translating and that's what someone like Peterson um, did is he turned it into a paraphrase because he's trying to get across the meaning, yeah. Yeah. but then you lose the accuracy of the original words yeah. and so on and so forth. So um, yeah. what we have is the you lose the personality. What what DBH does is he tries to give the personality of the writers yeah. back again. Yeah. So where should we start here on chapter chapter? Well, three? I want to start with how how do you preach this stuff? Yeah, so I just, I mean, my my approach when I'm preaching is, you know, I think sometimes um, it's it's challenging, isn't it, to to know where to start. You know, what, what right. is the thing that you know? And the the danger is that we leap straight into the commentaries, into the you know, you know, yeah, grab yeah, all yeah. the commentaries off the shelf, stack them up high, read them all through, and try and and all, all you end up doing, I think, stylistically, certainly, and and possibly even spiritually, is regurgitating a ton of academic commentaries. Yeah, right. At, at a very dry level, and there's nothing wrong with that. The comment the commentators are uh, are a great resource, but I, but where I start is what, what is it that leaps out to me? And the thing that leapt out to me in this passage was the word mystery. Okay. Um, that that he talks about in four places verse three verse four verse six and verse nine it comes out with with this word mystery which okay um so that's where that was my starting point that's what i felt like what what is it about this mystery that that is for us as the church and what is it <laughs> well it just used to say that um well i mean first thing i did is i kind of thought well, what what is it what is the word originally what, what yeah is this uh, that's something i don't know i mean go on show us your show us your commentary knowledge I mean, oh, you've got it locked go. and loaded ready well to go. I, I i look up uh blue letter bible and yeah. uh yeah. try and uh do a bit of a word study at the time um but uh the word mystery can also mean secret yeah. or hidden thing that which is hidden that which is yet to be revealed yeah right um and and so i think the interesting thing in this passage is that he speaks of this mystery uh, and yet when we read it 2000 years on, it doesn't feel all that mysterious. No, right. It doesn't. It, it's yeah. like, well, we know, we know this mystery, you know, he talks about, but, but actually the essence of the mystery and it builds on this particular passage. And of course we've already talked about the punctuation being added later. Well, so were the chapters and verses added later. Yeah. Um, that actually this passage builds on what we talked about last week, that there's this kind of, that the Jews and Gentiles are to lay down their, their kind of, or set aside, and that's the phrase I use, set aside their their primary identity is rooted in who they were as an eth as an ethnic group, right. whether that's Jew or Gentile, to form this new thing that, that Jesus is creating, which is called the church. Yeah. Um, and in in this passage in, in chapter chapter three, that's exactly what we see. Is what yeah. we see this is the mystery. Uh, and I spent a lot of my talk on on Sunday talking about verse six. This is the mystery. Uh, that through the gospel uh, in my NIV version here, yeah, uh, yeah. through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members of one body and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. That the mystery is essentially that Jews and Gentiles are, um, are now to be one thing, but a new thing. It's not the Gentiles joining with the Jewish thing or the Jews gen ju joining in with the Gentile thing. It is that they are to become a new thing and this is the mystery but so i talked a bit about mystery about secret thing what is it about uh this i talked about uh and built on what would, was we spoke about the previous week about that we lay we lay to one side in a world of you know left versus right east versus west you know yeah. cancel culture echo chambers we you know we lay down those primary things that we 
that we pivot around our identity. So, you know, yeah, have we a claim on our allegiance, right? Right. And we lay those down for the sake of something else and for the sake of others. And that's what it means to be the church. And, and in an increasingly echo chambered world, I think this, the, in the end, where I got to in terms of a mystery, why is it a mystery? Well, if you look at our world, they would look at how the church operates. If it really does operate according to how Paul uh, says it here, yeah. then really that, that really is a mystery. People would look on it and say, that seems odd. Why, why in a world of splinter groups, of identity politics, yeah. or, of you know, your faith getting interwoven with political allegiance, with, um, you know, the, the, the cancel culture, all these different things. Why in a world like that would this group of people operate in such a way that they lay down those things that most people are orientating their entire lives around? Yeah, right. For the sake of another person. And that in and of itself is the mystery. That well, because, is because, and then, and then he even goes further, right? Because in verse 10, he, he talks about how the church or the assembly, David yeah. Bentley Hart calls it, this, or the church, what we now think of as the church, um, his intent was that through the church, the wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers mm -hmm. and authorities. So it's not just that the, the mystery is revealed to the church. It's that the church is the thing that is, pro by being the church, by doing what you just said, right? By laying down those allegiances, by being united as one, that itself becomes the proclamation to the authorities to the yeah. rulers and powers and so it's like the church is not just a a passive body it's actually it itself is a a communication to the powers that be that what right. we're doing is different and i think that's yeah. that is a part of the our collective identity that we're not so good at which is to own the sense in which the church like israel was that's why paul talks of us as this the new israel yeah. that we are to be we are to embody something prophetic well, I think to the world. One of the reasons why we're so, we find that so rarely actually happening in, in church, <laughs> in our institutional churches, just in our church life, is that I think we've, we really have not got a lively sense of what powers and principalities are, or, or the archons and rulers, which gets mentioned here in verse mm -hmm. 10. Uh, because, and because, so basically, if your church is not, proclaiming to the powers god's god's mystery and god's wisdom then it's not a church so paul thinks the church is the thing that proclaims to the powers god's wisdom so if you aren't proclaiming to the powers god's wisdom you aren't the church wow okay yeah that's the function paul doesn't even think the function of the church is to love each other well or to worship god well or to say a set number of words in a liturgy at the same time he thinks the the church is the thing that proclaims to the powers. Hmm. So could we talk a little bit about what the powers are? <laughs> yeah, let's let's do that because this is great. Because actually, I didn't spend too much time on on verse ten. Yeah. Um. So it, I think it'd be great for us to dig into this a bit deeper. I mean, and it is connected to the to the to the mystery is that the Jews and Gentiles. And we've talked about that many times, right? Yeah. And and you're absolutely right. It is it is about that kind of laying down those bodies of forms of life which lay claim to your authority and or to your allegiance and that have authority yeah. over your life and they give you your yeah. identity and and again we can use like high powered language for it but really we all live in it right like we all live in that idea of like uh people you know you're born into a certain type of family and then you, you come home one day and you say i've met the woman i want to marry and that woman might not look and sound like the people that you're born into or yeah a girl brings home the, you know, this is the man I want to be with for the rest of my life. And the parents just suck their teeth and they go, Oh, but is he yep. people like us? Is he going to fit yep. with people? Like us? So these are, these are forms of life that they happen to us every day. And yeah. it isn't just this kind of extreme moments of like war and invasion, right? Like we're living through now. It's, it's everyday actions as well of, Oh, people like us tend to prefer people like us. You know, it's that kind yep. of attitude. And those are the kinds of things that Paul is saying. When we lay that down, we are proclaiming God's mystery to the powers. Mm. When we hold that stuff lightly, we are making a statement and revealing God's mystery to the world. Mm -hmm. 
and the powers and principalities here or, or rulers and archons they're going to show up again in ephesians 5 and 6 like very famously right our struggle is not against flesh yeah. and blood yeah and i've talked about this many times but it's it it is in the, in Paul's thought and in the early Christian thought, the powers aren't just demons. They are faceless powers. And really very often powers and principalities are actually human institutions, actually. So elsewhere in, in Paul's writings in Colossians, especially, he's going to talk about powers and principalities as, mm -hmm. as military mm -hmm. might. He'll talk about it as government in Romans 13. They'll say powers and principalities are special holy days, new moon festivals, mm -hmm. Sabbath days. That's a power. He even talks about like uh, time, neither height nor depth, neither so gravity, neither future nor past, nor any other power, he'll say. In Romans 8, he'll talk about that. will separate us from the love of God. So in Paul's imagination, you have to remember that a power and a principality is more than just a demon. It's any creature any created thing which has sort of grown in grown too big or it, it it's a created thing which which was in which was invented to have a point and a service which now we are serving hmm. right so they aren't just angels and demons but angels and demons are also created things which now have taken more than they like if you worship an angel then it's you know or an angel is a demon that has lost its purpose and rebelled mm -hmm. and likewise government is becomes a, a a demonic principality when it forgets why it's there and and that kind of thing so you can start to see why paul thinks that talking about jews and gentiles coming together and eating together is itself a huge statement against the powers and principalities yeah yeah right because yeah uh, because being jew is a power being a Gentile is a principality. They are faceless, invisible powers which are influencing your life. And mm. they've and we need to sort of get our influence back again. We need to not serve these things. We need to have them yeah. serve us, right? Yeah. So this is the kind of role that powers and principalities plays in Paul's thought. And you see it showing up right here. And he thinks that the, the wisdom of God is is shown by the church when they stop acting like jew and gentile is the main thing that defines them yeah yeah it's interesting because i looked at this verse as i was preparing for sunday and um the i, I stopped short of sharing it partly because i was confused slightly by its meaning because paul adds in this clause at the end of that verse in the heavenly realms yeah because i was I, I wasn't too sure where the powers where the rulers and authorities were were these rulers and authorities that we that were on earth or it seems to suggest in the right, heavenly realms. Right. So, so I couldn't quite. Try, how how would you kind well, of bring that you, clause into it? Do we need to have a break, or do you want me to keep going? <laughs> you, you're the timekeeper. Is there a break we'll, coming we'll, up? We'll take a break. We'll be back in a minute. <laughs> Let's take a break. All right. I hope you're all well breaked and watered up because we're about to launch into some. Uh, hardcore philosophical theology chat about powers and principalities <laughs> fantastic and uh just before the break we i opened a can of worms uh and uh stephen rightly kept us on track for time uh where i asked them the question around this clause at the end of verse 10 that said uh that the god's intent was through the church the manifold wisdom of god should be made known to the rulers and authorities fine no problem that's what we yeah. just talked about but then at the end he says in the heavenly realms yeah. so how do you what powers and authorities he's talking about here well because because there isn't this big distinction first of all between spirit and material life right and if you think about it like uh uh money is an invisible system bureaucracy is an invisible system time is an invisible system you can't see time and yet mm -hmm. it controls your life, right? Mm -hmm. You can't see racism and yet it controls our life. Mm -hmm. You can't see our addiction to, to lethal violence to solve our problems. You can see the effects of it, but like some of the most powerful, you can't see patriotism, but it affects like some of the most powerful forces that affect our lives are invisible mm -hmm. in a way that the early 
21st century mindset describes that would be to talk about it as spiritual or heavenly. Hmm. So they're not necessarily talking about uh, uh, Satan living in, in some spiritual realm or God right. living in a spiritual realm. They're talking right. about like the invisible world. Got it. And then that, and that the physical world, like, and that the invisible world is not only is it as powerful as the physical world, quite often the invisible things are the most powerful things. Mm -hmm. And that's not to mean that they are super spiritual. It just means they're invisible. And that's partly what's going on here. And also the word heaven, of course, is a, a word of ruling and reigning. So remember, heaven is like the place where God reigns. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a place of reigning and ruling. So to talk about the powers and principalities in the heavenly realms, to talk mm -hmm. about the things that are ruling and reigning us. Yeah. And then there's, yeah. there's an added sort of vibration here of, and Paul will talk about the human. He'll talk about the sons of God or sons of man. Later on, he's going to talk about, we talked about this earlier, about the, how God is the father of all, of all mankind. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then there's this stuff about authority. And there's this, do you remember I've talked about before about the sons of God and, and, and the, and the, what that means in the Hebrew world, right? Well, for, why don't you remind us for I those mean, it's who really, may not pick up? It is kind of, we are going off piece here. I'm fully aware <laughs> of it. It's, it's kind of work that's happening behind and underneath this text. It's not, Paul's not talking about it specifically. Okay. Yeah. But uh, a, a word, the phrase that the Hebrew Bible often uses for rulers and authorities is sons of God. Right. And, and so sometimes they'll refer to human rulers as sons of God. And sometimes they'll refer to demons as sons of God. Mm -hmm. And sometimes angels as sons of God. So famously, uh, when, when Abraham, he, he, ho he has dinner for three angels, right? He hosts three angels. Mm -hmm. They're called sons of God. Uh, or uh, sometimes evil rulers, like the, in, in the book of Daniel, evil rulers are called sons of God. Mm -hmm. In the book of Job, Satan is called the son of God. Mm -hmm. God calls together all the sons of God into his throne room and Satan is one of them. And, and Satan is one of the retinue of co-rulers over the universe, right? He's a, he's a being with authority. Mm -hmm. So the word son of God is, has a connotations of authority and power. It's not just uh, a word reserved just for Jesus. That's for sure. And it doesn't mean divine. It means uh, 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 has authority. Mm -hmm. Okay. And sometimes that can be good and sometimes that can be bad. Sons of God do not necessarily. In fact, a lot of the time, sons of God don't reflect the character of God at mm -hmm. all. Right. And that's part of the problem is that in the Hebrew Bible, the sons of God often do a bad job. So there you'll get like in, in various Psalms and things, the Lord will call together the various sons of God. And then he'll say, and they're often called the nations, right? So the nations are ruled by sons of God. Okay. So God will call together the rulers of the nations and he'll say, you're doing a bad job. You've forgotten the cause of the oppressed. And you get these Psalms like, why do the nations rage in vain? <laughs> why do they rail against God? And there's this constant theme that the nations being are being ruled in rebellion against the way of God. Okay. So in the book of Daniel, there's a prophecy where all the sons of God are sort of doing a bad job. And then they fade away. And instead, one comes like the son of man. Son of man, yeah. And the Lord says to the son of man, come take a seat at my right hand. I'll give you the reign. Okay. So that's when Jesus shows up and he starts talking about himself. People voice the word son of God onto him. Demons will say, we know who you are. You're, one of, you're a son of God, for example. But the phrase that Jesus takes for himself is son of man. which doesn't really have it's not like he's denying his divinity it means he's tying himself to that daniel prophecy mm -hmm. which has to do with rightful authority rightful rule and reign the sons right. of god have done a bad job it's time for the son of man to come one like a human being by the way yeah it's time for people to take their rightful place as as you know in control so there's still there that imagery of the powers and principalities being put back in their place that, and then when they talk about how everything is thrown at Jesus's feet and all the powers are put back at his feet, the idea is that like, things are being put back in their rightful place, which is what, exactly what Paul is doing here. And he's saying, believers, when you fellowship together, when you give up the powers and principalities, they don't control your life anymore. You are putting those things back in their rightful place. You are assuming the right 
authority over those things. Yeah. Yeah. And there's language of being like a son of God that shows up throughout Paul's letters. Mm -hmm. And you can see evidence of that even in these passages here. Even though he's not explicitly saying it, he's playing on these feelings mm -hmm. and these ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. There you go. <laughs> well, before we close, I just want to talk a little bit more going back to where we started, which is the idea of mystery. Because at the end of this passage, Paul says, I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Or in N.T. Wright's version, it says, so I beg you, don't lose heart because of my sufferings on your behalf. That's your glory. Mm. And, and I and I drew out on Sunday just mm. um, how, as a kind of modern Western culture, how, how unhappy, as it were, we sit with mystery. Yeah. And, I, and, and actually, mystery itself is a gift that Paul talks about this mystery that's been revealed to him that Jews and Gentiles should come together, but it remains a mystery because it, it remains something that's not been fulfilled. And it, you know, I don't, we don't yeah. see it in our, in our church and, and I'm sure there's no church in the world right. where this no. is, this is realized to it, to it. And we know we're not seeing it in the early church because they're constantly fighting Jews and Gentiles. Yeah, are yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's a mystery that's yet to be seen. Yeah. And I think um, one of the points that I drew out is slightly tangential, but, but actually, you know, pre enlightenment, mystery was all around us you know pre pre enlightenment we didn't have significant answers to significant questions in a kind of scientific tangible yeah. way um but there's some kind of since the enlightenment and onwards that quest for knowledge uh that quest for knowing more you, you know knowing more about our bodies knowing about, more about the way the world works knowing more knowing more no more no more has created a, a situation where when we do not know when we do not have answers and as paul talks about his sufferings yeah when we we, it, we don't feel safe in the unknown mm. and and yet what paul is writing to here when he speaks about mystery is very much a sense of of, of embracing mystery uh embracing the unknown uh, because that helps us journey with things like yeah. the questions of suffering uh, and and interesting we you know we talked before about kind of uh nice trite little answers, theological answers to oh, right. to the big questions but actually sometimes actually what's needed is not an answer that gives a nice tick box exercise but us to sit content in the mystery of god that there's yeah. a sense yeah. in which the transcendence of God is as important to hold intention as the imminence of God, you know, and we talk a lot about God with us, Emmanuel, um, but actually we need to sit better in mystery because that helps us journey with questions like suffering um, because we can hold a space where we say, I don't know the answer to this, but, but what we do have is we have a God who suffers with us and that's what we see in on the cross. Yeah. And this is, so Paul began this little section by saying, I'm a prisoner. Yeah. He breaks off to talk about all this stuff about mystery. And then later on, he says, don't be distressed by my suffering because it's actually for your glory. And a lot of people notice that there's actually a similarity between what's happening here in Ephesians and what, and Paul talks about in the book of Colossians. Okay. And in the book of Colossians, he, he explicitly connects this, uh, this, uh, witnessing to the powers with Jesus's crucifixion. Okay. And he calls that the crucifixion he says is the thing that puts the powers and principalities to open shame at the cross, mm. which again is a, a, a public humiliation, a public suffering at the hands of the Roman empire. Yeah. All is in chains at the Roman empire. He's suffering. Jesus suffered at the hands of the Roman empire. And Paul is saying, these are not evidence our sufferings is not evidence that we've done something wrong. It's the other way around. The, the suffering is itself the sign that the powers are being witnessed to. Yeah. Yes. So don't think that because it looks bad that they've won. Yeah. In fact, them looking bad is your glory or, or us looking bad is actually your glory. It's the, the powers are being exposed to open shame right now and they're mm. fighting back, but it means that, that we're winning or it means that we're showing them something. And you're mm. right. It's like that idea that like holding this idea of mystery and suffering without having to instantly tie it up and feel like a winner all the time. It's like, no, that's what Rome does. That's what empire does. 
they mm. they jump quickly to to squashing all voices that mm. don't fit with their program they quickly solve all their problems with a sword we're not doing that we're actually mm. going to submit to it and suffer for a while and in that suffering we're revealing something true yeah so yeah there you go Thank well we're going to end there that's fantastic what a great way to end uh, thank you, Stephen. Another wonderful time together. Uh, those of you who've been tuning in either live on uh, YouTube or uh, on our podcast, thank you for tuning in. Do share it amongst your friends if it's of help as we journey through Ephesians together. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. Bye, friends. Bye.